All right. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second session of Women in Astronomy Working Group of the IAU. And I hope you are having a good General Assembly meeting. Uh, we have been getting a lot of interesting remarks from the participants regarding our first session. So now we are going to have the second session today, and uh, it has been chaired by myself, Mamta Pomi, the chair of IAU Women in Astronomy Working Group, and Aran Lo from the Korean Astronomical Society. And uh, we are very happy to welcome our first speaker of the session, that is uh, Professor Priya Hassan. She is the co-chair of the working group of uh, Women in Astronomy, and uh, she's going to talk about empowering women through training and skill development. So Priya, please take over. Thank you. Thanks, Pamanta. And thanks for giving me this opportunity to talk about the training and skill development program. So. Um, I, I, Mamta and me joined the working group of women in astronomy last year. I think it was in August. And that's when we were thinking about what are the various things which we need to do, which can actually play a role in, you know, in, in solving this issue about gender imbalance and uh, the things associated to that. And uh, I was very confident, you know, very uh, strongly believed that the important factor is training and skill development. So essentially, if women do have the skills which are required for research, they will obviously be wanted wherever they are. And uh, one way of therefore tackling the problem is that we need to power, our, empower our women with the necessary skills which they do have for research in astronomy and data analysis. And that could you know, solve the problem in a, much, in a very simple way. So because of that, yeah, oh, sorry. So I, this thing, so like I said, when we started last year in August, we were focusing on the various difficulties, the different problems which are faced by women in astronomy. And uh, you know how all of them are also important things which need to be handled. The reduced career prospects, the leaky pipeline, lacking role models, childcare issues, all these are very important, but uh, training programs is something which I thought would be effective in also handling this problem. So the idea was to have training programs every two months. And uh, we also decided that these programs would be open to all, men and women. In the sense, because one of the, 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 the idea of having the group is that we do not want any kind of discrimination between men and women, right? We want that, you know, the gap to not exist. And therefore, we thought that the training program should be open for everyone, men and women. Let everybody learn the skills. And uh, in that way, we, you know, we can, it, it could be a fair deal. So this is the first training program, which we organized in November. And this was, all these were called TPs. And the, the first TP was the essential skills for astronomy research. And they were conducted by me along with SN Hassan. And uh, we did it, this was a five day program. So you can see it's a five day program with two hours per day, which covered topics like Python, Matplotlib, AstroPy, Overleaf, the basic initial skills which are required for research. And what we did is we um, step by step showed them the process in the sense more with hands-on sessions using Jupyter notebooks. They actually could run commands, run codes. They could plot things with uh, Matplotlib as well as Seaborn and, uh, you know, actually do practice sessions along with the assignments. And uh, obviously it's very difficult to keep track of attendance in such a virtual session because uh, in the next slide, I'll show you, we had participants from all over the world. So it would be very possible that participants may log in at a time, you know, which suits them because everything was recorded and available. So to keep track of the performance of students or participants, we decided that uh, the certificates would be given based on completion of assignments. So participants are free to attend whatever suits them at whatever time they want. The only thing is we need in terms of feedback from them is to see the assignments they did. And based on that, we gave them certificates. So, um, oh yeah, it's, it's described more in detail. So like I mentioned, you had five days, two hours a day. And uh, each session initially started with a short 30 minute talk, basically explaining what was the importance of the thing we were supposed to be doing. And then one and a half hours for practice hands-on sessions and uh, with the tutorial problems, et cetera. So we also had a Slack channel, which is still running, which is to interact uh, for interaction between participants of all our training programs. So uh, what we did on the first day was introduction to Python, Jupyter Notebooks. Then we did more of Python. Then we did Matplotlib. 
And then we did ADS, Overleaf LaTeX, Astropy. So obviously this is at a very superficial level. This is not the depth level. But the idea of this was to initiate people so that once they know how to run these things, you know, then they can go deeper into it themselves because all these things are very, very deep. Uh, you know, they, they are oceans in their own right. So if you see this, this is the kind of uh, participation we had. We had about 203 registrations and you can see it covers the almost whole globe. So uh, we were working also with the Astronomy for Development Office, due to which you can see we had a very good participation from Africa. And we had also from South America a lot of people. Uh, Europe and the US is also there. We had Southeast Asia. So the, the idea is that, yes, definitely the requirement is there. Uh, yesterday I attended the Young Astronomer sessions, and that's also when they were talking about training programs. So everybody in principle wants training programs, which we actually saw from our results. Uh, so all our training programs are available on our uh, website, which you can see over here, uh, sorry, on, on the website as well as the YouTube channel. We have both. And you can actually see the stuff which is available over there. It's freely available. So the feedback, we, we try to keep track of what was the feedback for the thing. So most students were obviously very happy about it. You'd think that I'm showing you a biased thing, but in principle, we didn't have any complaints. Maximum complaints was, you know, there should have been more sessions or it should have been deeper. But essentially, people were happy with the training programs, and uh, we had a very good feedback from that. So assignments, we gave people two weeks to complete the assignments. They could uh, interact with each other using the Slack channel. And we also gave a prize for the best partic participant, the one who gave up maximum assignments. So obviously, uh, there were five assignments for all the days. And we kept, I, I, I think we kept a thing of, if you'd done three out of five, we gave people certificates. But then there were some who actually did everything, and uh, we had a prize winner. Actually, I should have had a picture of us. OK. So we gave them uh, certificates of this kind for completing the training program, and um, uh, which you can see over here. So the trainers are mentioned over here. You can see Priya Hassan, SN Hassan as the trainers and uh, <clears throat> coordinators of the program. So after this, this was in November. So as per our schedule, two months, we had the next training program in January. And in January, we actually did it on, we had some more participants. So we had, um, we had Santiago, who's going to speak after me. He spoke about the sun on uh, exploring solar uh, images with visualization software. And then we had another session. So, so Santiago did two sessions on the 10th and 12th. On the 11th, we had a session by Ariana, who spoke about Twitter for scientists and how social media can be used effectively. And uh, on the 13th and 14th day, I uh, added in with my session on TopCat. TopCat is a virtual observatory tool which can be used to, uh, uh, you know, to analyze tabular data. So one day was about TopCat, and then we actually took up uh, its application to select science cases to basically show this to students. So again, this was the same theme, five days, two hours every day, tutorials, assignments, and certificates based on the number of completed assignments. So uh, this is, again, the same thing repeated. This was the schedule. Solar for two days, Twitter, and TopCat for two days. OK, <clears throat> so then to stick to the schedule, we had a slight gap between January because we were basically busy in February, March with women in, you know, it was the women's months. Uh, February and March, so we had a lot of other activities which we were conducting because of that. So then we had, with a slight gap, we continued in April. In April, we had the third um, training program, which was uh, basically uh, done by me on um, what we actually did is we took science cases. We took specific science cases and showed students how could you use virtual observatory tools, as well as Jupyter notebooks to analyze these specific science cases. So the science cases range from, you can see on the first day, we did exoplanets. The second day, we did photometry using SDSS data. Third, 13th April was on color magnitude diagrams with SDSS as well as Gaia. 14th was on dark matter. Uh, and uh, 15th was on AGN, so using SDSS spectra. So what we did is we actually thought, you know, showed them how would you actually do science cases using virtual observatory tools, as well as introduce them to how they could do this with Jupyter Notebooks. So we had students who submitted their assignments either with TopCat or with, uh, you know, with TopCat or with Aladdin, you know, the virtual observatory tools, as well as with Jupyter Notebooks, right? So they were given the freedom to do it in either way which they wanted. 
So, uh, so like, uh, sorry, this is another detailed description about this thing where it was astronomy data to science. This was the, the plan of the, the third training program. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, that's my, this is my final slide. So essentially, we, we're, this has been progressing very well. People have been very happy with the training programs that we've been doing. But uh, what's my wish list? The wish list is obviously we want more mentors to provide training programs because there's a limited amount of knowledge I have and the areas I can handle. Uh, we would obviously like uh, training programs which cover different wavelengths and different kinds of data so that uh, students, you know, at least have a starting point with which they can start off with their research. Uh, so uh, we, I, would, I, so my, I would urge uh, people listening to this is that if you could uh, offer training programs of any format which you would like, uh, this could even be uh, younger students. For example, if you've worked on a PhD thesis, you could speak about the kind of analysis you did for the thesis. Uh, at whatever levels, if you could contribute by doing training programs, uh, then I uh, hope that we, you know, build up a, a good repository of, um, you know, of, uh, you know, material which will act as very good starting points for students to actually start off in, you know, whatever uh, areas they'd want. Because I personally also, as a researcher, I know that when you start off with your PhD and you're handling uh, software and data analysis tools on your own, it's very difficult to do it. So if, if somebody could start you off, you know, you can obviously then move on your own well. So that's what I would, uh, I would urge the community for active participation in this kind of program. Uh, so please, I would encourage people to get in touch with us if you would like to give any kind of training programs and any of these things, as well as any suggestions which you think which would help us in doing this in a more effective way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Priya. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, I think what? <clears throat> right. Anyway, so I think one so, important... Yeah, one second, on. there's a question, please. Yeah. Hi, do you have any data from the attendees in terms of demographics or... Yep, 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 I do. I showed you that one map marker, but I have a lot more like detail. Like the gender balance as well? Or... Ah, okay, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, like I said, we kept it open for men and women. And by the time we were to training program three, we had more men than women, which was obviously a little upsetting because the purpose of the whole thing was for women. And then the whole effort... I mean, there's nothing against men. It's very good if men are there. But, uh, you know, we then noticed that, you know, there were more men than women. And I don't know what do we do about that, because how do you pull people to come? Uh, so thanks, but that's, that is a problem that probably because of uh, societal biases or whatever, there are anyway lesser women getting into this stuff. So for all you know, the training programs are helping more men than women. <laughs> but that's okay. Thank you. Well, one of the points to add over here is that uh, that is true. There are more men than women in these classes, whether at master level or at uh, PhD level or even at postdoc level. And that's the reason if there are more men, of course, the attendees are going to be more <laughs> men. <laughs> so we did encourage. And again, the second point that one has to remember is also that women, they, even if they are younger, they still participate into child caring and parental caring and caretaking activities at home. So because these sessions were recorded, they were also following them in the recorded version rather than being available at that particular hour. Yeah. So that's another reason. Yes, I think Najam wants to ask yeah. a question. So, yeah, so that's right. Actually, we don't know the demographics of the online attendees. The ones I know is the ones who registered for the program but or who were there on Zoom, but online maybe. Like Mamta mentioned, maybe at uh, you know this, they could be women. Yeah. Uh, we observe that in India there are a lot of girls in biological sciences, and very few in mathematical and physical sciences, and probably that is the reason why even it should be the same all around. And uh, I think it's necessary to work at a grassroots level, right at the school level, encourage girls to take up a career and mathematics, physics, astrophysics, and so on. So you will have to start working even at a very low mm -hmm. level. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, thanks. But Thank uh, the thing is that since there is an IAU office on outreach and education, so, you know, to avoid stepping on each other's toes, we 
we kind of uh, are not working exactly in outreach because there is an outreach office. So, you know, we, we, though we have, the, the, for example, the women, uh, the women events which we had in March as well as in February, right, for the Women's Month and all that, what was done in collaboration with, uh, you know, girls and women in astronomy as well as the outreach group. But um, yeah, we, we, yeah. we don't exactly have an outreach program for women specifically because there are already existing bodies who are doing that. But yeah, that, that is probably, that's the only way this problem can be solved. <laughs> yeah, IAU has uh, astronomy for education, so they do have some training program for teacher and more younger students. That's right, that's right. right. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Thank you. Well, there, there is also another point, as, as uh, Nacham has mentioned, uh, there are more girls in biological science than in physics or in mathematics classes. It's even true in France and universities in France. It's the same situation where I teach. And uh, I have also noticed that uh, parents who in, in families where mothers are actually in academic fields and especially in higher academics, not at uh, school teaching level, they are the ones who are serving as role models for their daughters also to take up higher academic careers. So it's not just about working in school levels, it's also about the society and where women are being seen as have holding jobs. This is where their daughters are also thinking that they have possibilities of having jobs there. So I think it's also very important to appoint women at higher academic levels while working at the grassroots level because you need role models at every career stage in this whole academic uh, uh, career profile. And this is what is lacking. This is where we have to work together. Yeah. Thank you, Priya. Okay, so we no. don't have any yeah. other questions. Uh, there's no more questions here. Yeah, but it's, it's just fine yeah, because okay. we can have plenty of okay. questions. So that's yeah, good. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Still, we have two more minutes. But we can. Any other discussion you'd like to talk? Any comments? We have two minutes more. Any comments from anybody in the audience? Um, what do you think could uh, would be a good thing to do? Okay, so if we, oh, you want? Yeah, I guess yeah, so yeah, we have one more question. We're really looking for feedback please, from people. Yes, please. Uh, because no one else is speaking up, I will uh, just add a little comment. When I first, uh, I we came from the field of peace and conflict studies. It was quite some time ago that I was in that and I realized we needed astronomy and we needed more women in astronomy as a perspective for achieving the goal of right human relations. And so I'm just wondering, the first conference that I went to in cosmology, I studied in Australia, actually. And the first conference, there were three women, <laughs> all of us trying to look professional, and, uh, and many men. And uh, now in Australia, I think they can't get uh, a grant to do an astronomy conference unless they have childcare. <laughs> included in the proposal. So we've come a very, very long way. And I know what my ideas were about the need for women in the sky and uh, as a bridge to uh, our greater reality. But I'm just wondering, what do you really think is the, the benefit for society of having women in our field and more women in our field? Thanks. So, I mean, if women are excluded, you are basically excluding 50% of the population, right? So all the input you could get from people, you're actually halving it. So that is the first most important thing. And uh, the other thing I would say is that um, being a mother myself, I would say that the future generation, right, does get a lot of, um, you know, in, in childcare, there's a lot that gets transferred to every child from the mother, Right? And therefore, the mother's background, obviously the father also plays a role in the life of the child, 
But the mother has a more key role in grooming the child, whether it's a boy or a girl, in either way. And therefore, it's not just 50% loss if women do not work, you know, do not get into STEM. I would say it's more because uh, then the future generation, right, which is basically, you know, handled by the mothers, is also oriented differently if the mother is from STEM or not STEM, right? So. But I'm just wondering about the STEM and it's important to have women in science. But why do you think, what are some of your thoughts about why astronomy? Why is it important to have women in the field of astronomy for our society? <laughs> Mamta, you want to take that? Or? Yes, I can take that, yes. So, well, to start with, uh, if you have looked at the statistics which we have already published on the IAU website, uh, women in astronomy website, you will see that there are only 20% women on an average, 20, 21% all over the world who are active in astronomy. They don't get permanent jobs. They don't get support to get higher level positions in astronomy. And the situation we have also published country-wise. And you can see which countries are actually lagging behind compared to the other countries which are actually more active. And as per the statistics, somehow Europe is always leading, followed by America, followed by Asia, and then the other countries. Australia has a proportion of active women in astronomy in the IAU community, community less than 21%. So that means that you have a very drastic and very evident gender imbalance in this field. And it gives a message to the students who are doing their PhDs and postdocs that this field is mostly for men and men are good at it, which is not true. Women are not being supported in the positions. What is the consequence of this kind of imbalance? One of the major consequences that we have started to receive is a lot of harassment, physical, mental, and abuse, sexual abuse, bullying, and all sorts of problems that women are actually registering in our surveys. We are doing the survey, we are collecting the information, they are posting it anonymously, we are not publishing their names because we don't have it, but the field is becoming unsafe. And there is another big problem because of this gender imbalance, uh, you have mental health issues in institutes. The institutes are not managing to form community of researchers to work together, and there is a problem of mental health. And these problems are actually very evident during all those kind of uh, big meetings which are happening, where even women participants are facing harassment in big meetings. And somehow there is no proper uh, uh, committee or no proper ethical or code of conduct committee who is managing to take care of these problems. So in any field, if there is a gender imbalance, in any society, if there is an gender imbalance, it is going to create problems for both the uh, genders, actually. One will suffer with mental health issues. Another one is going to suffer with harassment issues. So we need in any field, whether it's engineering, astronomy, physics, biology, everywhere we need gender balance. And we want to pass this message to the future generation. And why should astronomy be only a privilege for men and why not for women? That's another question which one has to pose. So, yes, especially the last thought, all of what you said, yes, I totally agree. So I just wanted to share that one thing that was very much uh, making me aware, because I came from more like looking at the society as a whole, what are the problems? And we still have a very uh, problematic humanity. And so my thought was looking at some of our ancient cultures like Egypt and some of these, and of course, India, you have the, when the men are having problem, they created Durga. So she was created to, uh, to uplift the society as a synthesis of all the vision. You have these great women who are the leaders of culture, Lakshmi and Sarsvati, and uh, in the Egyptians, so, uh, Nun is the, the queen of the sky, and she is to bring people to the higher level. And Ma'at, the principle of justice, of uh, integrity, of right relations with nature. 
This principle is so beautiful because it is the personified woman who is supposed to be between the universe and the earth. And we see all these problems in our society and all of our ancient cultures, especially, and all of our cultures tell us that when women, even in the Jewish culture, when women is more uplifted, you have a more uplifted society. It's the whole root of the transformation of the society. So it was my thought that, so we need women in astronomy, we need women working between the universe and what's communicating with our society to uplift the whole society. So I think there's something very special about having us women in astronomy in this field, really reaching out into the universe and connecting to our humanity, the values that we need to live by. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I would also like to add a very small so comment. We, we can go to next. Uh, yeah. Oh, but just, yeah. just one sentence. Uh, okay. I, I think women should have the choice. If they want to do astronomy, they should be able to do it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for everybody. So, for me, for next talk, please. Yes. Okay. So, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, we had a very nice comment. So, I would like to discuss more with the uh, the lady uh, who has just uh, given her comments. So we will come back to it during the discussion session. And now let's go to the next uh, uh, presentation from the next speaker. And he is one of the most active male members in our working group. He's always there to help. He's, I, I find him very helpful and really always available yeah. with good spirit. So please welcome the next speaker of our session, that is Santiago Vargas Dominguez. He's from the University of Colombia, and he is going to tell us how does gender equality benefit men. J Santiago, please take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamta, and hello, Priya, as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning in Korea. I am 14 hours behind you. I am in mm -hmm. Colombia, in South America, uh, still on the 10th of August here. So it's uh, 9 p.m. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this session. I want to congratulate them for a very compelling agenda uh, of this uh, working group. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and also to contribute to this session. And today I will be speaking about an important issue intended to answer this question. How does gender equality benefit men? So let me... Uh, give you a short overview of my talk. First, I will present some facts to be aware of. Uh, then I will point out what is the problem concerning gender equality and the path to accomplish it. Uh, afterwards, I will try to answer the question of why men should care about gender equality. And finally, how men can be engaged to accomplish gender equality. So in different talks, uh, many speakers have already shown some important statistics uh, concerning, for example, the identification of the gender imbalance, uh, for example, in research. Uh, but let me just show this recent article published uh, in the journal Nature a few months ago, in which they present some evidences of gender imbalance and the difficulties faced by women in research. For example, talking about prices, uh, the women's share of international prizes rewarding research excellence is increasing, but still lags behind the proportion or of, of the professional positions held by, by women. This was actually revealed according to an analysis of 141 top science prizes awarded over the past two decades. And the results show that the number of awards honoring female scientists has increased in the last uh, 20 years but women remain underrepresented in their career-defining prizes, which are often peer-nominated and uh, decided on by previous uh, recipients. But when women receive the deserved prizes, they receive less money and, and prestige compared to men, uh, an average of 64 cents for every dollar received by men. So this plot shows the, the inequality trend and this is the reference where you can actually get uh, more information on this study. So the point is that women are not receiving fewer awards because of the quality or the quantity of their research, but instead it appears to be the result of implicit bias, coupled with a lack of pro proactive efforts from um, 
to, to, to address inequalities uh, or inequities in science. All the evidence is revealing that the, there is a clear gender inequality, but what's the problem with that? Well, these points summarize some of the problems. For example, gender inequalities are everywhere. They are built into the system and the structures of our workplaces, especially at the highest levels. And they are reinforce, uh, sorry, and they reinforce a system that undervalues women and other underrepresented groups. And this is reflected in everyday sexism. So sexism in turn is present in daily actions where we, for example, evaluate women less positively than men, or we ignore and talk uh, over women, uh, sideline women in social and world networks, or express seemingly harmless comments about women, or for example, choose women for stereotypical assignments uh, among other issues that we are experiencing nowadays. So although we are moving in the right direction, uh, the road towards gender equality is still being paved. I probably don't have time to, to go into the details of some of the initiatives that you probably already know, uh, as well as some of the policies already being implemented, for example, in the European Union. But certainly the situation has improved a little bit. And now, for example, three, uh, sorry, there are more women uh, than ever uh, who are starting careers in science. Uh, the gender gap has reduced in that sense uh, in the last 15 years, as uh, can be shown in this graph. And also uh, in terms of awards and proportion of professors who are women, and these are the the results of this uh, study published in Nature a few months ago. So the situation is improving a little bit, but still uh, women are behind in many aspects compared to men in research and in other areas. Okay, but now in the second part of my talk, I will focus on the way to engage men in gender equality and why we have to involve men, actually. Uh, in short, the answer is because men are part of the problem uh, of gender inequality, and so we are therefore a crucial part of the solution. I think it's quite clear that men show less support than women for gender equality, including initiatives aimed of uh, achieving women's and men's equal treatment and workplace efforts to eliminate gender bias. However, this doesn't seem to be intentionally done by men. Many men just aren't aware of existing inequalities. Uh, men are shaped by lifetimes in a gender and equal world, so that, for example, sexism becomes normal, uh, taken for granted, or uh, and, and invisible, basically. So, in particular, we can identify these attitudes. Uh, some men, some men uh, see gender equality as a women's issue. Uh, men often assume that other men around them support sexism more than they do. Some men fear being judged by their male peers if they intervene. And also some men simply don't know what to do or what to say. So it is important to recognize that men are part of the problem, but also part of the solution. Uh, we will not make much progress towards gender equality without men's support. Obviously, not because women are weak and cannot do it or by their own, but uh, well, also not because men have been left out and are now the victims, uh, but it's just simply because men are, again, part of the problem. Um, how, how men think, uh, behave, and how they relate to women and to other men all these play an important part of keeping gender inequalities alive. Men's attitudes and behaviors may support uh, the sexist status quo, and they have a vital role to play in uh, building a world of gender equality. And many already are doing a lot of efforts. 
uh, but still there are uh, many things to do and basically many things men can do. But uh, we have to be careful because uh, these are some points I want to stress. For example, engaging men is not a magical bullet for gender equality. Um, avoid putting men on a pedestal for being actively engaged in gender equality. That's something that uh, typ typically can also happen. Uh, maintaining women's initiatives and women-focused approaches is vital. Uh, and finally, uh, there are many more points. I just want to stress these four. Uh, engage men at every level in your organization, but not just at the top. So it's a matter of considering all different men in different positions in your organization to be involved in these uh, strategies towards gender equality. So fortunately, there is a heightened interest among organizations in engaging men in the gender equality change process. After all, how can we drive change if we leave half of the population out of this discussion? Here we can uh, probably refer to what we call gender mainstreaming, which is a strategy for making women's as well as men's concerns, experiences and needs as an integral dimension of the design, the implementation, the monitoring and evaluation of policies and programs in the social, economic, and political spheres so that women and men benefit equally and inequality is not perpetuated. Actually, this concept, it was first introduced in 1985 uh, at the Nairobi World Conference on Women, and it was established as a strategy uh, in international gender equality policy through the Beijing Platform for Action that was adopted in 1995 by the United Nations. Uh, and then it was promoted uh, at different levels. So supporting gender equality requires more men uh, at least, but evidence suggests that men do not know how to support gender equality. And in some cases, for example, through the pandemic uh, that we experienced recently, most women wanted men to help them to address gender equality issues, but less than 50% of men indicated being ready to help. This is according to a, a, some survey that was uh, recently made, uh, I think it was uh, at the end of last year. So basically they don't know how to help. But definitely, definitely we can make a difference to gender equality as men. Uh, here, are, here are some tips. I probably don't have time to go to every single one. But actually, um, well, you will have these uh, slides so that you can, uh, by your own, uh, go deeper into every one of these. But uh, let me finalize in the last couple of minutes just by saying that uh, empathically, men should care about gender equality, both within and outside the world context, because they will benefit from the better decisions and reduce risk experience enhanced psychological development and well-being, work in organizations that are more productive and creative, experience higher quality work, experience enhanced personal growth and development, experience greater life satisfaction, experience an increased sense of purpose, and also, well, I encourage you to think about other possible ways men can benefit. So that this uh, involves everyone. So finally, these are some take-home ideas I want to uh, stress. Um, so the achievement of this gender equality is still, to a large extent, considered as a woman, as a women's issue. But it's important to increase awareness that gender equality is a societal issue which uh, concerns and should engage both women and men. I think that's uh, something I really want to stress and, and, and is the biggest stay home message for you. Uh, so this is a need to develop a greater understanding of the importance of gender equality for men and boys, as well as women and girls, and of the important roles that men and boys can play in promoting equality and hopefully in uh, 
50 years from now, the situation will come to uh, truly equal opportunities for, for both. These are some references for you to go deeper into these aspects. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention and very glad to be here again. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Santiago. I think it was great. As always, I think you put forward the idea of men's participation very accurately. And I think we need to work a bit more on this aspect uh, about how men can be helped to participate in, men in bringing the gender balance at workplace. Right. Sure. Any questions? Do we have questions for Santiago? So sometimes this, this topic generates uh, some debate uh, because obviously there are some groups only uh, specifically for uh, women to be involved. And sometimes it's like, well, why do we have to involve also men into our discussions, our ideas, our uh, projection? Uh, but I think this is something that actually can help to improve and to move forward towards our uh, objectives. It is true. You have pointed it out correctly. We had a discussion about it in the French Astronomical Society meeting, the yearly meeting at one point. And uh, there were some women astronomers who said, why do we need men in these kind of discussion? It's problems of that women are facing and it has to be solved by women leadership. It is true. But uh, I think by without creating awareness or training or putting forward the ideas uh, or problems that they are facing in front of all these uh, other gender, they won't manage to convey the message correctly. So you need to involve men equally in gender balance uh, discussions, issues and problem solving as much as we need women. So we need both. I agree with you. Yes, that's, that's the message. Yeah. Right. Any questions? Okay. All right. So we don't have any further questions, I guess. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, I will be here for the next uh, talks. Thanks. Thanks. Andrew. Okay. So I see the chair's mic is off. Could you please switch on your mic? We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Is that no? Mic? Yeah. Oh, oh, can you see my slide? Yes. Yes, uh -huh. we can hear you and we can see your slide. Yes. Oh, oh. I'm sorry for that. So, I will start my presentations. And hello everyone, I'm Xuan Xin from Seoul National University. And first, I thank the um, Women in Astronomy session organizers for giving me the chance to present the current state of young women astronomers in South Korea. Uh, on behalf of women astronomers in South Korea, I uh, today I will introduce about challenges especially for career break for young women astronomers in South Korea to continue their careers based on statistical surveys. Before diving into the problem, I want to introduce multiple statistical, statistical factors uh, which can help us to understand the social background of South Korea. Um, first, I look up the college element rate of women and men. The college element rate of women has overtaken that of men since 2005. And the difference between them increases as years pass. And in 2018, the difference is close to 10%. Based on these surveys, we can expect that more women uh, can have their jobs and continue their careers. However, when I check the employment rate of women and men in their 30s, uh, I found that uh, the, the trend is not in line with our expectations. Uh, as you can see in the raft graph, for both single and married, the ratio of men are always higher than those of women. 
It's factory for married. The rate of man is uh, uh, the rate of man is 26% larger than that of a woman. 26% difference cannot be easily understood considering that women have higher education level. On the other hand, the, the employment rate difference uh, depending on the country are shown in the plot. Uh, from OECD statistics, the difference in South Korea is more higher than the EU, the USA, and the average OECD countries. This means that a woman on a career break in South Korea is more serious problem compared to other uh, countries. To figure out the reason why the difference uh, in South Korea is too huge, uh, I searched for the ratio of uh, women using maternity and parental leaves for their first born child. Uh, these leaves are legally guaranteed in South Korea. So, however, um, the ratio of women actually using these leaves are not so high. In the raft graph, uh, the ratio depending on the job, their job status are shown. And as you can see, a woman with permanent positions uh, have more chance to use maternity and parental leaves. Uh, especially for parental leaves, um, the ratio of women with permanent positions have about 40% larger than that, that of women with temporary positions. On the other hand, uh, this ratio can be varied depending on the institutional types. For government agency and conglomerate, uh, this ratio can be as high as 70% and 60%. The stable jobs um, enable women to uh, use the, these leaves and uh, continue their careers. And uh, it is very sad, sad that um, considering that there are many uh, young astronomers who have a temporary positions, uh, they uh, they are impacted by uh, these rifts and career break. And I also check the labor force participation rate depending on their degree. I focused on young women and men in their 30s and 40s who earned their degree, on their master and doctoral degree in science, engineering, and technologies. The difference of labor force participation rate between them are 40 from 42 or 25 percent. I think this is unfair. So qualified women have a fewer opportunity to uh, have a jobs than men do, and this phenomenon is related to career break, which is a problem I want to deal with. To understand the low labor force participation participation rate of women with degrees, I searched for the ratio of married women in career break after receiving their degrees in graduate schools. And as we expected, uh, the ratio is very high in their 30s. Uh, this is very sad because as soon as receiving their degree, uh, they have no choice to seize their career since, since the average age for graduating from PhD course in South Korea is 30 at the earliest. It is a harsh reality for young women scientists in South Korea. And I also checked the region uh, causing career break for married women. There are five main regions, including various pregnancy and childbirth and family care and two types of child care. Um, in South Korea, um, children with age equal to or rather than eight years can receive public educations. Therefore, uh, there are two types of child care depending on their ages. Um, and uh, half of the respondents uh, answer that child care for children under eight years uh, is the most critical reason for career break. Uh, this means that it is important to support to support women who have children under eight years. So far, I have introduced the current state of a woman who experienced a career break in science and technology. Now I'm going to dig deeper, focusing on Korean astronomical society. Since there are no statistical surveys uh, reporting about career break in CAS, so I conducted the survey, and the purpose of the survey is to understand career break in CAS depending on sex, age, affiliations, and marital status. And I want to figure out the reason causing career break in CAS, and um, I try to uh, suggest the possible solutions for elevating career break in CAS. 
using the Google Forms, I received 170 answers, and the proportion of women and men are similar, and they, uh, the astronomers in their 30s give us the most answers. And 59% of respondents are married. The proportion of experience in career break for family regions, including indirect experience, uh, takes up about 50% uh, of respondents. Uh, before explaining the survey wizard, I want to warn you that uh, this survey wizard could not reflect the actual opinion of young women astronomers who leave academia because the, the notice encouraging them to participate in this survey is only delivered to the present cast members. So for these reasons, I regard the people witnessing a uh, career break um, um, in the academic workplace as the people who experiencing a career break uh, to increase the sample size. First, I analyzed the uh, reasons for career break in CAS for people who have experienced or witnessing career break. And I found that the most critical reason for career break is child cares. And the second one is pregnancy and childbirth. The difference between uh, the first and second region is only low as only low uh, only as low as three percent, um, indicating the main reasons for career break in CAS are related to giving birth to a baby or raising a children. This trend is different from that of a woman uh, with, uh, within the natural science because for them the marriage is the second reason for career break. However, uh, for young women astronomers in CAS, the marriage is not an obstacle anymore. And one interesting point is that 14% uh, of the people uh, think work of jobs as their main cause for a career break. This is interesting because uh, it is very different trend compared to other academic uh, fields in natural science. Uh, and it implies that I think um, the job, job in caste is intrinsically insufficient for both men and women. And I'm curious about total period, period of career break. And uh, half of the people answered that one to three years as the total per period of career break. And um, th this is uh, very sad because the research performance, which is critical to apply permanent or temporary positions, is uh, usually evaluated for a fixed five-year term. Um, thus, the career break per period cri critically impacts for women uh, to get the uh, permanent positions since most institutions in South Korea cannot account for the career break period. And I think this is the reason uh, resulting in low number of women astronomers in Korean astronomical societies. Then what happened to the people with career break in, in astronomy after using childbirth and child, leave, child care leaves? Um, uh, I ca based on the survey, I calculate the employment of uh, women with career break. And surprisingly, uh, 60 percent, over 60 percent, have temporary positions, uh, which are classified to uh, this. And um, while uh, 16 percent of them uh, can, be can be employed as permanent positions. And the lead employment rate in academia is about 60 percent, which is lower than my expectations. And what is very sad for me is over 20% of them uh, cannot be uh, cannot return to the workplace uh, despite their skills and their expertise. I think this is very critical loss for our academia and countries. And then I'm curious about the vision enabling women with career break to return to academia. Um, the reason the most people chose is that um, they fortunately found uh, proper pos job positions in academia. And second one is that they unfortunately um, be the considerate PI. I'm very shocked that um, the luck is the most important uh, factor in getting women back into the academia. And 
government to support policies and support from family are also important factors. However, these are not dominant factors. And suddenly personal will and capability uh, is too low. On the other hand, why are women with career break unable to return to academia? Um, break of jobs constitutes about 70% of total answers and the family issues um, consist of, takes up uh, about 30%. Um, these reasons are external factors. So a woman are unable to return to academia due to external factors rather than their uh, ability. In this slide, I'm going to know about uh, those of people who don't have experience or witness a career break. Um, as you can see, there are mostly 20s or uh, early 30s, they are more sensitively reacted to uh, family issues such as child care and pregnancy and childbirth than regular jobs. This trend is very different from that of seniors who think the regular jobs as the main reason for career break in cast. So uh, these ten tendencies indicate that young scientists need a policies that can balance work and family. I also asked for um, I asked all the respondents whether they are worried about uh, career break in the near futures, and among sixty uh, among them, sixty six percent uh, answered yes, and specifically they are worried about uh, the future career break due to lack of jobs and family issues. Um, in the next slide, I I will check the tendency of selecting these regions. Uh, depending on their sex and their ages. The result shows a clear difference depending on sex. Women, the orange bars, are more concerned about career break than men do, and most women think um, family issues as the, uh, as the possible reason for future career break. However, men think that a lack of jobs as the main reason for future career break. Uh, the obvious difference uh, implies that traditional gender roles will or could significantly affect their academic careers. And as their age increases, the ratio of experiencing car career break increases and ratio of worrying about career break decreases. Um, for um, young astronomers, um, family issue is the main cause for a career break. However, the late uh, sharply decrease as their age decreases. And for lack of jobs, um, there is no clear trend as a function of age. And unfortunately, 30% of astronomers at all ages suffer from lack of jobs. So finally, I introduced the solutions which, uh, the, which Korean astronomers think as the best solution for elaborating career break in CAS. Uh, the most popular answer is increasing the number of stable jobs in CAS, uh, a CAS and it takes up about 35%. Uh, however, in my opinion, uh, it cannot solve fundamentally, uh, it, it is not a fundamental solution for uh, career break in CAS because uh, the most critical reason for career break are related to family issues such as child care, child birth, and pregnancy. So uh, to improve the situations, I think that uh, we need to we need to prepare policies uh, um, enabling women to continue their careers and get a stable jobs. For example, considering career break period due to the um, family issues when estimating research performance and recruiting them uh, is very important. And also improving organization culture for member with career break uh, uh, is, is important. And furthermore, providing flexible term of contract and giving opportunity to take various leaves for uh, young astronomers with temporary positions such as postdoc will be helpful to continue their careers. Uh, these solutions are related to family issues and takes up about 60%. And I think 
the Korean astronomical society uh, will become a favorable community for young women astronomers if they uh, take these solutions seriously. And um, I hope that uh, it will be uh, come. It, it will come in the near uh, in the near futures. And I um, hope that young women astronomers not to lose their opportunity to seek self-realization and serve as a pioneer in expanding the breadth of our knowledge about uh, cosmos. And thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was a wonderful talk. So I congratulate you for all your work you have done. And let me first introduce you because you started your talk before we int could introduce you. So she is uh, Shu Hyun Sin from Seoul National University and she's a PhD candidate and she has given a wonderful presentation, uh, which we don't see so much when we it comes to women in astronomy sessions. So thank you. Now, my question is, uh, you did all this survey and uh, you are a young PhD student. How, and you, so you have kind of tried to understand the source of the problems, the current situation and how it could be solved. Where do you see yourself in this whole statistics? What do you think would be your situation if nothing changes in the next five years? Or what would you like to do to change it? Or what do you want that people apply as policies so that your career could be saved? Um, that's very good questions. And um, I have think about that, so <laughs> it's very embarrassed. But um, uh, I think uh, the second uh, solution is the best answer for your questions. I, um, uh, maybe, I'm trying to um, persuade the members of Korean Astronomical Society to consider the career break period when uh, recruiting the permanent or uh, temporary positions. Yeah. Yes. This solution, I think, is the best. Yeah. Okay, so one of the solutions is also that, of course, these things are there and these are basic problems which many countries are facing today. So your statistics just agrees with them. The number of working women with permanent positions is very less in, uh, in Korea as per the statistics. So that should go up, of course, because that causes gender imbalance and all sorts of problems that we see in institutes coming with that. Uh, one of the solution is also uh, lying in the hands of funding agencies. If funding agencies can come up with uh, five years uh, grants, then these grants of five years help the candidate to develop their career with a stability, and then they can go on with another grant. If there are no permanent positions or the, if there are less reduced permanent jobs, then parallel way of having a career going on in astronomy is by having long-term grants. So that lies in the hands of funding agencies as well. Oh, I think you're right. That's a very good idea. Yeah, I think about that. Thank so you. you should stress about it in your country to get grants for women. And so this is why I'm really advocating this women ambassador funding with the IAU. And I would like everywhere, all the people, <laughs> whomsoever is listening in all their countries, they come up with this kind of grants for five years for women candidates mm -hmm. so that their proportion could be increased and the, the gender balance could be achieved in research institutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions for the speaker? Not from here. Okay, thank you very much again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, so let's move further. We have next uh, talk on Astromanias, Empowering Girls Through Science by Loriani D. Araujo. Is she there? Yes, great. Uh, good
good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Loriani. I am a PhD student uh, in astronomy at the University of Sao Paulo. And today I will talk about astrominas, empowering girls through science. Well, astrominas isn't just a project, but a collective of women like me, Thaisa, Lilian Soja, and Elisandra, who wants to bring science to the life of girls. Well, what is astrominas? Astrominas is an acronym that combines astronomy with meninas, that means young girls. Astronomy, we chose work with astronomy because <coughs> due to uh, interdisciplinarity. So when we all talk about astronomy, we can talk about math, physics, and technology, and all er areas of STEM. Meninas is also a slang of one of the most famous phrase of Brazilian feminists, respeitas mina, that means respect the girls. About our dream. Our dream is to mystify science, especially natural and exact science, present a new perspe perspective on the life vision of young women in the search for gender equality. So, what we, we have to do? If girls can play with dolls, if girls can play with toy cars, maybe, girls can play with science too. So, we are present a new path in the conception of becoming a woman. <coughs> well, why do you do what do you do? We have here one survey of INEP, the research, uh, research, Institute of Research of Education Brazil. And here we can see that women uh, are present in the most uh, humanity course. But when we are talk about STEM areas, we don't have many women. So first we have pedagogy with a big number of girls. And uh, in the last we have engineer and information system. So we can see the scissors effect happens here, that happens here. Well, when we are talking about fellowship, distribution of fellowship, the CNPq is one of the most uh, important agents of the Brazilian research. And here uh, you can see how uh, the distribution of this fellowship is happen uh, in major majority for the men, especially when we are talk about STEM areas. So in this graph, we can I, sorry. <laughs> in these graphs, you can see that the uh, the problem increase in exact and earth science. Well, this is a global problem, we know that. In Brazil, we have many states, we have a big country, and this problem is a big problem in all states. So this graph is, is showing us uh, how, the, how the distribution of girls and men in the, in the eastern areas uh, is, in, has the inequality. Another thing that we have to talk about is the social inequality. When we all talk about finalists, of course, principal, uh, uh, principally in the Eastern area, we can see that the finalists are majority white people. So we have to talk about women and we have to talk about brown and black women and indigenous women too. Well, how does it work? The course is proposed for girls, cis and trans, from 14 and 17 years old. Old, he uh, it is fully applied online, so we can uh, we can uh, approach girls for all Brazil in this way, and we have the support of five godmothers who accompany the day of the days of girls through WhatsApp groups. Well, we have 15 of the vacancies, 50 of the vacancies for PPI, that means Preto uh, Pardo Indígena, what is uh, black, brown, and indigenous people. 
uh, we have seven, 16 for public school students and, five, and, uh, and we have vacancies for pri private school students too. Well, the course has have lectures by great names of Brazilian women scientists, include debates on women in a context of humanity. So we, are, uh, we have the grow, groundwork too, and we have the same ones of treasures in science from other great names. We have conversation circles with undergraduate and graduate students, and we have to the direct application of experience and construction of morals where the girls can show what they are learning in this course. Well, the course in this year, we have three weeks of, of course, and you can see in this table the main subjects of uh, the day, uh, the three weeks and every day. And for, for, for instance, we have the scientific method day, where the girls made experience about the age of the universe, they learn about the scientific method, and they have discussions about the cult cultural change for the construction of a better world, especially for us women. women. Well, in this year, we have a record of subscriptions, uh, 16, more than 16,000 subscriptions of girls for all over Brazil, but we have to uh, accompany this girl closely. So we have just 600 vacancies for, for, the, uh, for these girls chose randomly. Uh, we have the participation, the help of 73 fair godmothers and 56 speakers. Well, if we have the astronomers is a voluntary work, we don't have many records. So we think that if we have more records, we can uh, at attach girls for uh, more and more girls for Brazil. Astrominas is also became famous. We are superstars now. And we are in many magazines and newspaper from all over Brazil. And this is a, actually a really good thing. The record of subscription is due to that. So this is really, really, really important to, know, to us. Well, who we are? We are researchers and studies at, at University of Sao Paulo. Astromina is was conceived by the, prof, the professor Elisandra Cipriano. And Lilia Soja is making uh, research about uh, how these astromina are actually affect the life of girls. So we have many collaborators, many fairs, many coordinators that are being empowered to with this project. Well, that is that. That is Astrominas. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about our work. Uh, if you, you want to contact us, you, you can use the QR code or the social medias. And that is it. That is Astrominas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Leroni. I think it was it's a very good effort that you people are doing as PhD students coming up and training younger girls. This is not very common in many countries, actually. And uh, you people have taken the initiative, so I think that's really great. So it's important that PhD students also know how to help younger generation than just focusing on their data analysis or their publications. So thank you for this great job. Thank you. Any comments? Yeah. yeah, so thanks for a very good talk. That was a good talk. I just wanted to ask that, is there some follow-up program after that? Do you track what happens to your participants after the... Sorry, I didn't understand. After the school is over, right? How do you track uh, or do you check with your students what happened? What are they doing? Yes, with the closer component of the affairs, we always have contact with these girls. So uh, in this year, actually, we have uh, um, one astronomer has become a fair too. So we are uh, always accompanying the life of the girls. So they 
uh, our object is show the girls that they can do science, but they can do not to, but mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think that is the main object that we have, that okay. we want yeah. to do. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for the great talk and thank you for bringing, uh, showing us about this beautiful project. I'm Brazilian as well. And I'm curious about, um, did this, you said that uh, there, was, there were participants from all over Brazil. So do you know the percentage that comes from the Northeast? Because especially in the, I'm from the Northeast and I know that that is a region that still lacks a lot of science, especially women science. So I, I was curious about that percentage. Well, we have girls for Brazil, uh, and actually, the number of sub the subscription is bigger in this so so that so so that uh, I forgot the word. Sorry, but uh, we have the participation of the girls of rural Brazil. I think we we are atta attached everyone. Okay. I think it would be interesting to show some statistics of uh, the, yeah. Yeah, the distribution in Brazil and also a statistic based on what she's, uh, Priya said, like uh, how many girls took the science path or what are all the paths that they chose after, um, I don't know, later in their career. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so any other questions? If, okay. Uh, if not, maybe we can move to next talk, Pomier. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much again. And uh, I'm sure we are going to write to you at one point uh, to organize maybe kind of a training program with Women in Astronomy Working Group. Uh, the, the training programs like Priya was talking about. Uh, at one point, we will be asking Astromania's people to also contribute to this kind of training program with us. If if that's fine for you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so let's uh, move to the next uh, talk. And next talk is by my Sa'el Yazidi. And sh she's gonna talk about work opportunities and study of the female presence in astronomy and space sciences in Tunisia. So is my surround. Okay, I don't see her. I sent her an email, but oh yes, okay, I have some. Uh, I will not be able to make it today, still waiting. Please skip me for the next one. Okay, so I have an email from her uh, and she says, uh, I will not be able to make it today. All right, so I, I, I don't know, uh, maybe we will see what's going on. Okay, uh, so let's move to the next talk then. and. Uh, and the next speaker is uh, is actually so now from now onward it's Priya who was supposed to chair the session with Min Yong Lee. So I think Priya would like to take over from here. Uh, isn't that the afternoon session? Uh, no, that. That's the session after lunch. So now we have. Oh yeah. Break. Yeah. That's the so after oh. lunch. So we. All right. We still have a ten minute for discussion, free discussion. Yes. Yes please. yes, please. So if you, if anyone has any questions or if you have any projects to propose with Women in Astronomy Working Group, or if you would like to, uh, you know, contribute to this ensemble magazine where we are writing about any group who is doing any sort of activity to support uh, women in astronomy or girls in astronomy, then please contribute and let us know. And we will be very happy to uh, publish your work in this ensemble magazine on the IAU Women in Astronomy platform. So please do consider that. And, uh, and yeah, we are open for any kind of suggestion or comments that you have. So please go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, hello, uh, my name is Aran. So I didn't much to think about this woman in astronomy, but I do think uh, from my experience, 
for the very young children, like a primary school, uh, just exposing this woman scientist to, to this uh, young uh, child is still uh, very effective for the women in STEM careers. So I yes. can see uh, from few years before back, from my experience, to give a small uh, career talk in the primary school, that, uh, that class is supposed to be for the pilot class, but, but just uh, because of some accident, I had to go there for the astronomy for career, astronomy scientist. But when I get that class, I only can see only one girl among 50 these uh, students. So that means only one girl, she is the only interest about being pilot. And another 49, the, the boys are interested. And there was the, something bias in from our media and our society, I can see that. They think the woman cannot be the pilot. So that kind of thing from that uh, just one hour class, I could say, just exposing this many uh, woman scientists for the young children, still we can affect a lot of things. So still we have to go long way to go, but like uh, just uh, uh, when I see this Brazilian, our colleagues, when she gave a talk, they expose their women scientists to the many variety places. That can be the really good steps. That is the, my small experience. Yes, I, I think it's a very important comment. And it's if one could start to, I mean, we do have videos. We started to collect videos of women scientists and astronomers from various parts of the world in their local languages so that one could you know, play it and one could hear it in different languages. We have it. Uh, I haven't put it on the website, but we have uh, the ones from earlier years available. So one can use those videos for promoting uh, astronomy to younger students. But uh, it is equally important to actually include the students from your country in some small half a day project when they see themselves in this situation, this is when they will get the confidence of actually participating or choosing this field as a career because they see that they have a place here and they can contribute even at, at a very primary level. So what would be nice is exactly like Astromanias, if we could come up or uh, like we heard in the last talk, if we could come, come up with this kind of combined, you know, a program, which could be, done with the Women in Astronomy Working Group of the IAU at different schools, the same program in various countries. Just a half day or two hour session where one astronomer goes to the school and explain or shows the videos and explains few information, few phenomena in astronomy or upcoming projects or telescopes or rockets, all sorts of questions that students can ask. And then uh, make a video of it and we put it on our website and then the students watch it again and then they get more motivated because they are involved into it. So, so we, we, we can think about projects and we can come up with something uh, for sure for the next year. Any other questions? Yes, we have one, yes. Hi, Mamta, Th this is Susanna. Oh. Hi. So I had a question. Um, would you consider putting any of those videos on YouTube? Yes, of course. We have been putting our videos already on YouTube. We have our own channel. Okay. But we've got certain videos to promote women and young girls in astronomy for International Women and Girls Days. And those ones which were in local languages, I haven't put it because I got many of them. And I wanted to understand the content, but it's in local language. So before putting anything on the website, I really wanted to understand what the, they are conveying and try to, you know, write a little short description in English so that non-English speakers, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, the local language speakers could also understand the text in English below. That was the reason why it's taking time. Okay, so my follow-up is for those, would you 
have captioning as well in English for those? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Okay. This is why it's okay. Okay. time. Because sometimes it's in Japanese or in in Chinese or even in, 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 in other languages, which I actually don't master at all. I don't know. And so that's the reason why it's taking time. If it was with Spanish or Italian, French, I could still help, but not with these ones. So, yeah. Again, so my other follow-up question, the answer is probably you're already doing it, but you must have volunteers in those countries who are helping you with that. Well, uh, that's another problem altogether. Yes, we do have volunteers and they are the ones who actually passed this uh, whole thing okay. to the local okay. uh, astronomers in their countries via their NACs. And this is how we got all those videos. And we can, of course, ask them to do the translation. But most of the time, it was these, uh, uh, these uh, national representatives whom we have appointed. And they did it in their local language, but they don't have time to translate it in English. Okay. So it's a question of time, how much time they want to put into these things. And that's the reason why I think we, we should be contacting some people in the IAU who are used to translating documents from one language to another. If they could help us with this, then I think it will go faster. Yes, because that's going to be key going yeah. forward. And I'm, I'm speaking, I'll, I'm asking these questions because I'm ignorant, <laughs> but, but not anymore. Yes, all okay, right. Thanks. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so I, just sorry yeah sorry, sure sorry, just uh, i have one question to suhyun so i like to know whether what can be the her strategy to keep continue her career being astronomer she says there is a, i can see from her statistics the marriage and child care is a big problem for the women astronomers so for personally, I like to know, for example, so are you going to postpone your marriage or giving birth things, or uh, you are going to look for some another way to continue your careers? What can it be? Oh, that's a very good question. And <laughs> um, actually, I'm pregnant now, and I just defended as so, though. <laughs> and I'm going to go to the industry to keep my career on. Yeah, this very sad truth, but oh. that's my yeah, that's my best option, I think. Oh, already directly impact you, your career. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, so. that's so pity. So, <laughs> so like uh, Formia just suggested, maybe we might ask our fund the agency to have a building, some sort of a fund to, for the specific for women who are married yeah. or who has childcare, like things. The last time I remember for the, our lunch time, for women lunch time, many people, many women, they have a, a problem when they have a child. So mm -hmm. in the, some of the funding agency, there is a click box, whether you have a, a younger than three years old children or not, some sort of, uh, uh, they, they should consider the mm -hmm. fund agency for these women because they know reality. We can't really change all the, this uh, social system for the, this caring these children. So uh, do you think they can help to ask yeah. our funding agency, like uh, there is click box for the, who has uh, uh, younger than three years old children or eight years old children. You say the eight years is the, the critical voice, right? Right, right, yeah. So, so I think your suggestion is uh, will be very helpful for uh, young women astronomers so, as well as young men astronomers, yeah. So whenever we have a chance, we might ask the, our funding agency, we need the kind of click box, you know, uh, the woman, scientists who has younger than eight years old children should click and some of the benefit, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. For me, uh, so I can't hear. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So with the European Research Council uh, fundings, 
application, actually, we can really mark if we have students and if, uh, sorry, children. And if we have children, then uh, there is some kind of uh, relaxation in the, uh, in the age limit for which you can apply for the funding. And then like, if you have one child, it's 1.8, uh, one and a half years, actually, mm -hmm. uh, concession con in the age limit for which you can apply. So like if you if you apply for a typical funding where you should be PhD plus five years in experience, then if you have children, one or two, depending upon that, you will be given a relaxation of 1.5 or three years or more. So that kind of thing helps. But uh, uh, at 1.5, years age, a child is not independent or autonomous. The mothers are still taking care of them. And actually until the age of five, the children are going to schools, but the mothers, they get phone calls from the schools to come and collect the child as soon as the child is not feeling well. Mm -hmm. So you have actually a five years of, uh, uh, of uh, not full-time availability for your work. You have to spend time with the children who are really small and they need your care. And it's important for the society to have children and young generation. Otherwise you just break the whole society in the case of uh, in the chase of career run. Mm -hmm. So one of the right solution is to have equal paternity and maternity leave. There is no reason why the whole burden should be all put on only on the women and it shouldn't be shared by men. And it's equally important for the binding, the family binding and the father and children relationship and, and the whole society, I think. So that's one thing which one has to take into consideration. But having this, uh, this uh, tick box, as you say, in this application, uh, which one should try to propose to the funding agencies in your countries and institutions, uh, having children, but also having a relaxation of at least two years, if not, uh, you know, four months before it used to be four months or so. Mm -hmm. So that's really impossible. Mm -hmm. So at least ERC is providing 1.5 years for each child. So that's better, but I don't think it's enough. But uh, still better. Yeah. Many things we have to solve. <laughs> so, okay. Yes. Thank you for your study. So I think we had one question from a lady from Australia where she was talking about connecting. Women are playing the role. <laughs> Even in the mythology, they have played role for connecting people uh, or astronomers with the, uh, with the universe. I think it was a very interesting uh, observation and comment that she has made. And uh, that is more non, uh, I mean, people have been giving all sorts of talks in women in astronomy working group sessions in the past. All the talks I have heard in the past, last one year, uh, before last one year actually, was mostly about uh, biographies and society stereotypes. And it was just limited to that. You have blue toys, pink toys, this for girls, that for boys, and about the careers of women in astronomy. Uh, I think uh, funding agencies and uh, all those institutions are looking for numbers, are looking for figures, are looking for statistics, because we are in a field, we are in a domain where we appreciate data, where we analyze data, and when we understand the data, and we make conclusions, and we take actions based upon these numbers. So this is exactly what I would like to bring up with in the, the next two, three years of, of my position as chair is to bring up these statistics from all over the world for as many countries as possible. And that's what we have achieved in this session of this year's General Assembly meeting. So that's really great. So uh, th this is good. This is very, very nice. But at the same time, not forgetting the, the, the cultural aspect of having women at higher academic positions is equally important for cultural education and for respecting the values of different countries and different cultures and for existing in, in, in uh, how I would say in harmony with the diversity and appreciating the diversity in different cultures. And that's one way of binding with people from different countries because we are a very big organization and we are dealing with women from different parts of the world who are having different cultures and who appreciate different aspects in, in culture. Some people find career very important, some find family important. 
and some prefer more boys, some prefer more girls. There are all sorts of uh, uh, biases with that are there. Mm -hmm. So having the cultural aspect from different countries is equally important because it shows you how it influences the society. And it also shows you these statistics are equally showing you how these cultural aspects are actually either bringing up the society today or demeaning or bringing down the, 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 the productivity of women in the society. So I, I would like to have both, you know, so that we have complete information. Yeah, that's, that's what I would like to say. Okay, thank you. Any more question? If not, maybe we can close this session. Homia is okay? Yes, yes, thank you. And okay. see you later. Yeah, see you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you.